in this invitation. We're looking at the fact that God has given Jesus offspring of a kind, that the children of God are his offspring, that we become the children of God, and thus we become his brother, but also, or we become his brothers and sisters. But yes, we become children of God through Christ Jesus, and that God in a sense, gives Jesus children by, by means of us. So it's Hebrews 2, where he began speaking about the Lord having to suffer even to the point of death, but then he begins to show that this was necessary through the Scriptures, first quoting from Psalm 22 there, verse 12 of Hebrews 2, and then at verse 13, I'll put my trust in him, and again, behold, I and the children God has given me. And that's the one that we're interested in, in the, at the moment. Behold, I and the children God has given me. We become children of God through Christ Jesus, but this one who saved us, Christ Jesus, is in some sense uh, having children given to him by God, that we are somehow reckoned to him as his offspring. And that was Isaiah 8, the quotation, but if you go back with me into the prophet Isaiah 53, um, you can see that this is actually a long-running theme. Where in Isaiah 8, he said, Behold, I and the children whom God has given me. Here in Isaiah 53, among the things that are said, this is the famous, the famous passage about the suffering servant, whom we know to be Jesus, as Acts 8 shows, the man reading Isaiah 53 asked, does the prophet write this of himself or of somebody else? And we're told that from that passage, Jesus, uh, rather, um, Philip began the to tell him the good news about Jesus, if it wasn't obvious already. But there is especially in the 10th verse of Isaiah 53, this little thing. He will see his offspring. He will prolong his days when his soul makes an offering for guilt. There's this promise that when he pours out his life and he becomes the sin offering, he himself is the sacrifice. Well, you know, that means that he dies. And earlier in Isaiah 53, I should say, earlier in Isaiah 53, he noted this too. The, the eighth verse said, By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living? He doesn't have a generation. He doesn't have, there's not a next generation. There, there are not children. He never, Jesus never married. He, didn't, he did not bear children. There is not another generation. He was cut off out of, from the land of the living. He was oppressed, you know, by oppression and judgment. He was taken away. As for his generation, who considered it? He had no generation. There was no next of kin. He was cut off. And yet the 10th verse said, when his soul makes an offering for guilt, he will see his offspring. Well, he didn't have any. But when he becomes the sacrifice for sins, then he sees his offspring. Then he will see what comes. And that's talking about us. And, you know, that 54th chapter finishes or completes, uh, continues the thought when it says this in verse 1, Sing, O barren one who did not bear. Bring forth into singing and cry aloud, you who have not been in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than the children of her who is married. 
says the Lord. What does he mean by that? <laughs> well, it's very similar to what you just read in Isaiah 53, that even though he was cut off from the land of the living and had not any literal offspring, yet he has the spiritual offspring because of what he has done, so also the barren one sings. The children of the desolate will be more than the children of the married. There's somebody here who does not have children according to the flesh, but will have spiritual offspring. And the answer to that is given in Galatians chapter 4, where we turn together, please. Uh, Galatians 4. As you may well know, the church in Galatia was being troubled by some who wished to impose traditions about the law of Moses upon these non-Jews who had obeyed the gospel. Traditions about their food or their circumcision or whatever else that are not bound in the Lord God today. And Paul examines them, beginning at verse 21 of Galatians 4. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, don't you listen to the law? What's the law of Moses? It's written, Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman, one by a free woman. We know this. We know Sarah was free, and Hagar was not free. She was the slave, Sarah's slave. He had a child by Sarah, Ishmael, in the normal way of having children, the way anybody would have a child. But the, that's, I'm sorry, the child by Hagar, Sarah's servant, came in the normal way that any child would come. But the child by Sarah came by promise, he was 100, she was 90. She had been barren her entire life, even when she was you know, pre the time when you can't do that anymore. Now, certainly at 90 years of age, she's way beyond that. But that is when God said about this time next year, you'll have a son. And they did, and that was Isaac, the son of promise. All right, Paul, so Abraham had two sons, one by slave, one by free. But, Galatians 4.23 continues, the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through the promise. That's what we just said. Now, this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. And Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. What's Mount Sinai? That's where the Lord appeared to the people. That's where the Ten Commandments came. When they left Egypt, they gathered at the foot of Mount Sinai. It's the establishment of the law of Moses. Hagar's Mount Sinai in Arabia, she corresponds to the present Jerusalem. That is to say, the Jerusalem that then stood when Paul was writing this before AD 70. She is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother. That is to say, the children reckoned according to the flesh are no longer the spiritual. They're no longer the children of God just because they are born according to the flesh. The reckoning of the lineage of God is a spiritual one through the child of promise, Isaac, and as Paul said, she, uh, Jerusalem, that is to say, the physical kingdom of Israel is in slavery with her children. The Jerusalem above is free, meaning that 
the birth of a child by promise because Sarah and Abraham had faith. That spiritual family is the family of God today. That is free. And that's what the church is made of. She is our mother, for it is written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, You are not in labor, for the children of the desolate will be more than those of the one who has a husband. That's why Isaiah said what he did in both the 53rd chapter, where the servant has no offspring, is cut off, and yet when he makes that offering, he sees his offspring, he prolongs his days. And of course, the Son of God lives evermore. Death no longer has power over him. And we are the children. Behold, I and the children God has given me. We are reckoned as offspring to him. And so also in Isaiah 54, when he says, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear, there is coming a time when it's the spiritual kingdom who come from all nations, not just from Israel. They're the ones who are numerous among the saved. They're the ones. We're, we are the ones who are the children of God today. That's what Paul says to them at the 28th verse. Now you brothers like Isaac are children of promise. Just as at that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, which is true. Ishmael made fun of Isaac when Isaac was weaned. Then he made fun of him. He was laughing him down, scorning him. That's why they got kicked out. So also it is now. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. It's clear. The line of inheritance comes through the promise, not through the flesh. So, brothers, we are children not of the slave, but of the free. We are children of promise. And this is why, in closing, this is why you read in the sixth chapter of Galatians. In the 16th verse, well, even the 15th verse, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but a new creation. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus when you obey the gospel of Jesus. When you're baptized in his name for forgiveness of sins, you're a new creation. Circumcision or uncircumcision is not really the point doesn't matter. The point is the new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them, even upon the Israel of God. The church is the Israel of God. This is the spiritual kingdom. We are the spiritual children. We're the ones who are reckoned to Jesus. We're the next of kin. We're the next generation. And every one of us obeys God for ourselves. So this is the spiritual Israel. It's the Israel of God today. We are his children. We are his congregation. We are the people. This book is our book. It's what creates us. It's what generates the church in every generation. Today, are you a Christian? Are you a citizen of God's kingdom? We have prepared as much as we can. We have water prepared that you might be baptized in his name for forgiveness of sins. If you repent, if you confess, if you give your life to him. Today, are you a Christian who hasn't lived right? Repent. Think about what it is to be called a member of God's family, to be reckoned a child of God, a next of kin to Jesus. You know, he entrusted his mother to John. That was, you know, that had to be done. Those are earthly matters, but they matter. And yet, 
There's something far more glorious than this in our spiritual family in Christ Jesus. Become a Christian if you have not done so, or if as a Christian you haven't lived right, repent, be restored, come back into the fold of God's family. If you need our prayers, if you need to be baptized, let it be, let it be known at this time, please, by coming to the front while we stand and sing.